بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the Lord's name The merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer <coughs> Highly glorified is the love of all things وَأَشْحَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ I bear witness that there is no deity that there is no object of worship except Allah alone that is without any associate or any partner <clears throat> the creator of everything Allah has no equal and needs no one for support and Muhammad Shaduan the Muhammad and Abduhu or Rasulahu and Muhammad is his messenger like all of the other messengers of Allah Abdullah a servant <coughs> Alhamdulillah the praise is due to Allah as we embark on the beginning days of Ramadan we are coming to terms as to Allah's authority. Allah mentions that the seat of authority is with Allah and that Allah is the authority and the highest authority. Allah grants authority to man, but man is not to lose sight of the ultimate authority and is guided to humble himself to that authority. Allah, he says in the Quran, Allah, there is no God but He, the living, the self-subsisting, eternal. No slumber can seize Him nor sleep. His are all things in the heavens and on earth. Who is there to intercede in His presence except as He permitted? He knoweth what is before or after or behind it nor shall they compass aught of his knowledge except as he willeth. His throne do extend over the heavens and the earth, and he feels no fatigue in guarding or in preserving them. For he is, that is the law is, the most high, the supreme. Alhamdulillah. Sadaqallah wa adeem. And Allah, Allah speaks the truth. <clears throat> this verse that we recited in the translation, English translation, is called Ayatul Kursi, or the verse of the throne. It is a verse that is mentioned within a surah that is said to be equivalent to 25% of the Quran. And it's highly recommended to learn it to memorize it and to recite it often. It has been called by some of the scholars the greatest ayah in the Quran. Cursey can be defined literally as a chair or a footstool. However, in most translations, it is translated as throne. The Quran also mentions the word throne in other places, one in particular as arsh, and then there is another word in reference to the creation itself, al muq which is also used as one of the attributes of Allah, being that Allah is al malik al muq the owner, the sovereign, the eternal owner and sovereign of the entire creation. Some refer to the Percy as the footstool and the arsh as the throne so I have to give an indication which is more grand the Percy is smaller in comparison to the arsh we will focus on it from the aspect of the chair or, or throne as something that we can visualize for the monk or the arsh would take a lot more to attempt to incorporate into what I want to mention today a footstool is a low stool for resting the feet 
for resting the feet on when sitting. And it can be considered the lower portion of the chair. Allah's mercy, he says, extends over the heavens and the earth, and Allah never takes a rest or a nap from the marvelous work of creation. And Allah does not get the least bit tired. This is speaking to the supreme majesty and power of Allah, and an answer to the notion that he created the earth in six days and then rested. Allah never takes a rest. Allah is not like the king of a country or a president or any earthly leader. Allah is not a flesh being. The king of a country or the president will eventually get tired and have to take a break. And they need help managing the kingdom or the country. They can't manage it all by themselves. They require assistance. Allah lets us know that Allah's chair footstool or better yet the seat of authority is not limited to the earth but the heavens as well and not only does Allah not feel any fatigue in managing the earth but Allah feels no fatigue and taste takes no rest from managing the heavens either in fact Allah is the one who is the sole owner possessor and ruler of all kingdoms Allah's influence, power, and authority is unlimited. Allah has complete authority to act in any manner, any time, in any method. Allah is Lord over all worlds and systems, whether manifest or unmanifest, in the open or hidden. Allah has all authority to decide what is to be created, what will be sustained, and what will cease to exist. So we shouldn't confuse Allah and compare Allah to any human being. It is said in a hadith, the one who recites it, that is Ayatul Kursi, after each of the obligatory prayers, then death will be the only thing preventing him from entering paradise. And when you lie down in your bed, recite Ayatul al kursi then you will have a protector in Allah and no shaitan, no devil will come near you until morning comes. You have to sleep and while you sleep the, the shaitan are still working on their scheme. However, Allah never gets tired, never sleeps and assures your protection when you cannot. Sometimes those in leadership positions lose sight of reality and forget that they have limitations, that the world doesn't start and stop with them. In some cases, people don't bow to anything or anyone. They think that the authority is with them. Allah's authority supersedes all other authorities. In our prayers, we take a bow in Ruku. Then we go all the way down to the position we call Sajda and put our head on the ground, acknowledging Allah's authority over us. Once we complete it, we have to do it over again a second time. That being Sajda. And the second Rakah, just as well, just have to, we just have to be sure there's no mistake about what we mean. Once you complete it the second time, then that's when we take the seat in Jalsa. Once we acknowledge and submit to Allah, then we are fit to lead ourselves and others and sit in positions of authority with the understanding that the seat of power and authority belongs to Allah. For our lives to really take meaning and form intended, our perception of our creator has to be correct. We have to see Allah as the ultimate authority, the only object of worship, the creator of everyone and everything. We cannot let something mold or shape our thinking to the point where a profound respect and appreciation for our creator is minimized. That is, if we believe 
in a creator and believe we are accountable to the one who created us. People have ruled over people for so long and made their rules so absolute that time has eaten away at faith and belief in Allah. Ayatul Kursi is a dynamic that puts the perspective on Allah in a way that lets us know that our creator is not a human being. That our creator does not exist like we exist and is always in the work of creating and never takes a break from the work thereof. Allah says in the Quran, no just estimate have they made of Allah such as do him. On the day of judgment, the whole of the earth will be but his handful and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. Glory to him, high is he above the part that they attribute to him. It is important that we assure that our attention is directed at and focused correctly on Allah. As kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers, monarchs, as well as tyrants, they come and go. Only Allah starts, started the process of creation, continues it, and sustains it. Allah never has and never will take a break. Allah is at the seat of power and authority, and no matter what the world looks like or who has the leadership positions, Allah has dominion over everything on the earth, in the heavens, and the entire universe. No matter what anyone thinks, Allah is always in complete, in complete authority. During the month of fasting, we are to focus on Allah being the authority, and we discipline our lives accordingly. Once we complete the fasting, hopefully, not only have we acknowledged Allah as the authority, but also made Allah the authority in our lives. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Amen. Again, there is no deity, there is no God except Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Muhammad is the universal prophet, the universal messenger to whom Allah reveals the Quran, and he says of him, Muhammad that is, that you will find in him an excellent example of conduct, behavior, and that he is rahmatan, rahmatan lil alameen, that he is a mercy to all the world. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Allah mentions to us in the Quran about the month of fasting. And you know, I imagine all of the all of the imams are talking about fasting in Ramadan today. That's just the first Friday in the month of Ramadan. And for some of us it's the third day, and for others it's the second day. Some people started fasting on Thursday. And some of us started fasting on Wednesday. There's always some controversy about when to start fasting. Sometimes it takes the scholars and the ulama 
and people, generations to catch up with science. So there was a time when they said a lot of other things were not permissible and shouldn't be done. And now we're, we're doing them. So it's just a matter of time before they follow the verses in the Quran where Allah says the sun and the moon are following courses exactly computed. And now that we can determine the exact time of the, the Hilal, then we should be able to determine from that knowledge, you know, when to start fasting. <clears throat> The one thing about Ramadan we'll go into and mention is that Ramadan is a time of ilm, of knowledge. And knowledge opens the doors. It opens the doors of teaching and, and teaching is actually giving. Teaching is opening and opening of a, a, a great blessing. And one of the highest forms of zakat which we say is the cat is purification. So we said that the highest or one of the highest forms of purification is teaching or the cat, the, the cat of teaching. <clears throat> and we know that the at the root of the cat is the meaning to purify. And Allah, he says in the Quran about the fasting, that Allah doesn't want it, want to make it difficulty, doesn't want it to be difficult for us. Allah wants that we be pure, that we be purified. This is what Allah wants. And so we could ascertain from that that the goal of fasting, the goal of Ramadan is purification. Purification. <clears throat> But we mentioned that it's a time for ilm, for knowledge. Because it's difficult to get to the correct uh, way of purifying oneself and we don't know how to do it. If you don't have the knowledge, it can't be done. If I'm offering as a cat, I'm offering up something I earned or acquired from my possessive disposition. In other words, it's something I believe, I feel, I think that I own it or it's mine. Most cases I think something is mine, then I think I possess it or it actually belongs to me. We say my, my spouse, my wife, my husband, my brother, my this, my that. It all points to a sense of possession first person possessive context, mine. It's mine. When something is mine, we tend to be protective of it. And in many cases, we tend to endeavor to keep it and we're not so quick to share it. To share it implies that giving of something of the self. And giving of self tends to make you think or feel that you're losing something. That you're about to lose something that you may deem valuable. So we may be reluctant to part with it. It may have sentimental value to us. So we might tend to want to keep possession over it. Knowledge is also like that, especially if we think we have some. In the stock market, if I have some knowledge of how it works, then I can use that knowledge to make money or to increase my earnings from my knowledge or understanding of how the market trends affect supply and demand and how they affect consumerism. If I have insider knowledge, I might want to keep that to myself and capitalize off of that knowledge to benefit myself only. They call that insider trading and they put you in jail for that. If you've got the inside track the inside knowledge on a thing in the stock market and you capitalize on it to your advantage, then the Security and Exchange Commission will pay you a visit if they catch you. And it's a strong possibility that you're going to jail. 
So in other words, it's wrong for you to use knowledge that others are not privileged to for self-gain. Knowledge is what gives you an edge or an advantage. What Ramadan does most is expose you to, to knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of re revelation. And the discipline of Ramadan is the catalyst for benefiting from that knowledge. The cat is the major exponent. A person who believes and promotes the truth or benefits of an idea or a theory or a champion. So the champion of Ramadan is the cat. The cat is the form of purification on multiple fronts. Man's sense of the cat increases with Ramadan and the fasting associated with Ramadan. What's happening during Ramadan? What's supposed to be happening? We're supposed to be, what are we supposed to be doing? One, we are abstaining from ingesting any food during the daylight hours, along with abstain, abstaining from a few other things that we normally do in the day. Now in the daytime during Ramadan, not only is pork haram, but all meat is haram. Not only is all the meat haram, but everything else that we consume is haram right now. These are the haram hours for consuming food. And not only is that, but also water is haram during the fasting hours. Yeah, you can't even take water during the hours of fasting. These things are basically those things that are good for us. Food, drink, normal human activities. However, this is the physical aspect of fasting. We're also to abstain from vain conversation, ill behavior, improper attitude. In other words, it's not only about abstaining from food that enters the body, it's also about food that enters the mind or food that affects the sentiments. We are to make ourselves aware of everything that affects us and whether it is a positive or a negative influence. We are to focus on that which Allah, what Allah wills for us to focus on. This focus leads to purification or opens the door to purification. What does all this have to do with knowledge? Ilm, in Arabic, it translates into knowledge. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, seek knowledge, to seek knowledge is obligatory for every Muslim. The word, the word alim, as well as alimin, the world, share the same root as the word ilm. What Ramadan brought to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than anything did was and is knowledge. It brought with it much more, but its champion is knowledge. Why are we saying this? We are saying this because it is the truth for one, and that everything in this deen started with Prophet Muhammad being commanded Ikra. Read. The first message that came to him, and it came more than once. Allah mentions this word in the chapter, bearing the word twice. We're informed that Jibril mentioned it three times. Adam, as we've been speaking to, was made from being taught. Allah says he taught him. This is how Adam was formed. We say created. Allah says made or formed. Allah says that the soul was created and the male and the female were formed out of that creation. So man's soul or the human soul is both feminine and masculine. And it was created and then Allah made from that source, Allah says, male and female or many men and women. And Adam is representative of both. Allah says he made them and put them in the garden and he taught them 
Allah taught them in the garden, and Allah taught them how to cultivate the garden. So Adam is formed in knowledge. He was the first being formed in a specific way. That specific being knowledge. The knowledge of what? It's not just the knowledge of revelation. We say wahi or revelation. Allah is given Allah is giving Adam the knowledge of creation itself. He teaches Adam the names of the things in his natural environment. So Adam is formed on the fitra of the natural environment. This is how he's made. He's not getting the kind of revelation that the prophet would get after understanding nature. He's getting an understanding of the nature itself first. He's getting knowledge of the physical environment that he's in and he's comprehending and understanding that, that environment. He's working in that environment and he's becoming a student and even a science, a scientist in that environment. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. So this is the knowledge of, that is natural for the human being to absorb. This is knowledge of creation and knowledge of the external environment that the human being is exposed to. Allah teaches him directly due to his ignorance and his innocence. What is his innocence? His innocence is his ignorance or his not knowing anything at all. Where is the sign? The sign is in the child that exits the womb of its mother the child exits the womb of its mother with two opposing, two opposing attributes. Innocence is the first and ignorance is the second. Every child enters the world with these two attributes. This is given by default to his need to know. If man is conscious, then he needs to know some things. As an infant or a child, the mind falls under the protection of its parents and its community. His parents and community provide an environment or circumstance for him or her to develop. His or her development is tied directly to his or her acquisition and assimilation of knowledge. He becomes an entity that is absorbing the knowledge of the physical environment around him. So at first he's just absorbing the, the information. While he has it, he's using it, but he's not understanding it. He may not apply it correctly. And in that understanding or lack thereof, he may misuse it. But he comes into the world with a need to know. And Allah wants us to know. And so now Allah, he mentions later in the Quran, he says, Ar Rahman. He, he, he comes a, a, at another time here now. The beneficent God taught the Quran and created man. And now, he, now it's revelation. Man, once he gets to a certain point, he needs revelation from Allah to sustain and to perpetuate his life and his existence. So Allah gives us Ramadan and we, he says, the Ramadan is the month that the Quran was sent down. Yes, it's a Quran, the Quran and it brings with it the light of revelation to complement the nature, to complement the fitra that Allah created us in so that we can evolve and grow to greater heights of our humanity. So he says he taught the Quran and he created man. So we know he's not talking about the birth of a man biologically, He's not speaking to that. He's talking about the birth of a human being in the aura, in the aura of revelation. And Allah sends revelation, he says that he revealed it to bring you out of the darkness of ignorance and into the light of understanding. That's what, this is what Allah does for us. So Ramadan is really that month that brings back the mind. It brings the mind back to where the mind should be at. And our mind should be focused, what? On Allah. We mentioned before that the halal, 
You know, it sounds like halal, but it's the hilal. It's the crescent that you see on the right side of the moon, right? You see it on the right side of the moon. And so it's, it's giving us an indication of what's halal, what's proper, what's right, what we should be about. And we should be focusing on what the remembrance of and the appreciation of Allah, what Allah has given us, how Allah has blessed us, and how Allah is guiding us in this deen. So we, we abstain from the perishables, the perishable goods in the world. No, the perishable, those are things that's gonna, they're fleeting, they're gonna die off. They don't last long. You know, the food, when, if, you don't, if you leave it out too long, it won't, it won't last that long. It's gonna spoil. It's gonna go bad. So eventually it'll get to a point to where you can't eat it. Yeah, it'll get to a point to where you couldn't eat it at all. So we refrain, so Allah lets us know that even some of those good things can eventually turn into bad things for us, especially if we don't approach them correctly. Yes, if we don't approach things correctly, there's a possibility that they can bring irreparable harm to us. You know, people are, they say in this country, that we, are more, we eat more snacks than any other people on the planet. That we consume more. You know, Americans, you know, we are consumers. We like to consume things. We like to take in everything that we can take in. We don't like to refrain from nothing. Yeah, we're very, very, a very possessive people. But as we mentioned earlier, Allah is the one who has possession over all things. And everything eventually returns to Allah. So nothing is really ours. So Allah blesses us with Ramadan so that we can break the attachments that we have to things. So that we can separate from things. So just in case the time comes when we have to separate ourselves from something, it's not difficult for us to do it. It's not hard for us to do it. We're able to let something go. So you're not supposed to drink. You're not supposed to eat. You're not supposed to enjoy. You're not supposed to engage in sexual activities, the pleasures, the pleasures of life. You're supposed to abstain from, abstain from all of that during the times when, the, when it's most visible. And then you have to wait until iftar. You have to wait till the sun goes down before you can embark upon those things, those permissible things. Once, they, once the sun sets, they become halal again. While the sun is out, they're haram. And we might say, well, you know, we might, might sometimes, you know, you might have a tendency to go and sneak a little bit, but it's haram. Yes, it's haram now, no matter what. And we know according to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we intentionally break the fast, you can't make it up if you fast at a lifetime. And you have to fast one, 60 days for that one day, just to atone for it. That's how serious, because Allah says it's best for you if you fast if you only knew. That's the best thing that we can be doing. So, so it's that occasion, that time, when we come to abstain to abstain from just about everything. But we said that we're also supposed to watch what we say. In other words, the brother so-and-so is not an SOB or an ML and all that other foul language that we use regularly, that we use regularly all the time. We have to abstain from that. You have to be on your best behavior. In fact, you have to almost be angelic during the month of Ramadan. We're not angels, but we're supposed to be almost angelic. We're supposed to be very, very mindful and very, very careful of what we say, what we do, what we think, what we feel, over and above the consumption of food and water and those other things. So it brings us really back to the mind, to the way we should be thinking, because we're supposed to be thinking like that behaving like that when all the time anyhow.
this is the way we're supposed to behave during the month of Ramadan. This is the way we're supposed to be all the time. Because Ramadan is given to us as the model month. It is the month that we're supposed to model every other, all the 11 months by. Yes, the 29 or 30 days of Ramadan is supposed to be the catalyst for our molding and shaping our entire life. Being mindful, abstaining. Now, you know, now after Ramadan is over, we can eat food any time of the day. But we're supposed to always be abstaining. Always, what is abstaining? Abstaining means to stay away from certain things. We're also always supposed to be cautious of certain things. And when Allah makes us cautious of the things that we're constantly involved with all the time, then when it comes time to be abstained from something that we know is harmful to us, then it should be what? It should be a piece of cake. Yes, it should be easy. The person that has a habit of smoking, any kind of smoking, hashies, marijuana, whatever it is. If you got a habit of that and you don't and you know not to and you know you're not gonna be doing it, now you might still be sneaking and doing it during the fasting hours. But if, during the fasting hours you ain't supposed to let nothing come inside you. You ain't supposed to inhale nothing. You ain't supposed to snort nothing. You ain't supposed to do anything. But what? Love and obey Allah. Focusing on Allah. That's what everything is about during the month of Ramadan. And what it does, it brings back your mind and it puts in your mind the knowledge that Allah wants you to have towards your own existence. Yes, it's the knowledge that you're supposed to have towards how you should live your life as a Muslim. And your life should be lived as a Muslim abstaining from things in this world that are perishable, that are soon, sooner or later gonna die. Because if we're not careful, they'll consume us. They'll take us to the hellfire themselves. So let us take this month of Ramadan and benefit from it and use it as it's intended to mold and shape our present and our future. It's not going to do too much about the past. We can certainly mold and shape the person you are today and the person you become as a result of it. So we think we should be thankful to Allah for the month of Ramadan. It is the most, this is the most blessed time of the year for us. It's a long, it seems like a long period of time, but it's going to go fast. You know, the first 10 days we say, we said according to Prophet Muhammad is what? mercy and we should be looking for the mercy of Allah you know it's merciful for Allah to give us this you know that's the you're going through that that pain and struggle yeah. you know you know you, you you when you ain't eating so much you know you you get tired you get fatigued a little bit a little more I know it because I'm driving down here I, when I drove Wednesday I had to stop almost every half an hour and take a power nap I'm like man I couldn't even drive down the road so I, may, I might have to take me a little bit. I might have to get me a little bit of something to keep myself up, keep, keep, my, keep myself, get, get some energy. But then, you know, when that spirit kick in, because the spirit is going to kick in. The spirit of Ramadan is going to kick in. It's just a matter of time. And when that spirit kicks in, then that's not going to be a problem anymore. It might be a little difficult starting out the gate, but trust me, it's going to get easier. And then the time may come in your the time may come in your life when you looking for Ramadan to be every day. Alhamdulillah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Kama salli ka ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Mubarak ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Kama barak ka ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Fil alamin ina ka hamdun majid. Amin. Alhamdulillah. Thank you.